Our topic today is how to be an actor and a Christian, how to work as an actor and a Christian in Hollywood. And we're speaking to a great Catholic artist that's living and working as an actor. Uh, he's done quite a few commercials. You might have seen him in a gecko or spot or two. <laughs> Geico, <laughs> Geico spot or two. A Geico spot. Uh, or recently in the Young Rock series, he has a recurring role. Welcome back, everyone, to the Pinedo Brothers podcast. I'm JP, your host today. Peter is not able to join us, but we have a wonderful guest that's going to step in and really take the reins here. Mr. Mike Hawley, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, hello. Hello, people. Mike and I, we are working together on our upcoming project, The Socrati. If mm -hmm. uh, This is the first you're hearing of this project. It is a faith-based or a film about faith. Uh, but it's a horror film of the horror genre, very similar to Nefarious and has a lot of pro-life elements and maybe a few other elements that Mike and I are going to discuss. His character is one of the leads and, well, I shouldn't have favorites as the writer and director. I shouldn't have favorites of characters, but I find his character fascinating and I think we couldn't have a better actor uh, to jump, <laughs> jump into this role. So, Mike, tell me, what drew you to this script when I sent it to you and I was and you were reading it? I th this is one of those that, uh, yeah, I think and I think I told you too. like it just it was written so well and it was so spooky. Um, we're both stroking our beards at the same time. <laughs> it <laughs> yeah, was it was so well done, so spooky. Done. and yeah, it's crazy because you said, you know, I want you to do this role. And I was like, this is not like a year ago, I would have said no, like I just this is not what I do. This is heavy. It's 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 demanding. It's scary. Um, it's all this stuff. And I'm like, I do commercials. I play funny little guys, you know, and, and you said, I, I trust you. And I was like, all right. Like, this is the first big thing that I think, honestly, not too long ago, I would have said, no, I can't do that. That's not what I do. So this will be. Yeah. Uh, and then then since then, I'm like, OK, like it's a lot of work. Yeah. And I don't you know, I, I don't like when actors and stuff like like, like this, you know, fake modesty like oh whatever you know oh did i get an oscar no like i don't know how to do these things like preparation i'm learning i i'm reading the script and i'm just like oh wow so i've got the script read it read it again highlighted my lines now i'm going back putting on my cards and trying to go okay what's going on here how how is he feeling what does he know you know this kind of stuff that's very actory talk but it's like yeah how does that how does that work so i'm getting way off topic, but I read it and I was like, James, like, that's amazing. Like I got the creepy crawlies and I think I had to like watch TV before I went to bed or something like, you know, watch the office. Cause I'm like, I don't want to go to sleep with that script on my mind last. So very effective and yeah, really neat. I liked it so much. Wonderful. That's incredibly yeah. gratifying to hear you say, and to jump back oh, to man. You said earlier about this was something that you're not sure that you would have you would have taken on a year prior. I was it's it's fascinating to hear you say that because I was a little worried that you wouldn't. I knew that you were the actor that I wanted as I was writing it. I knew you were the actor I wanted. And I I, I came to the realization as I was writing this character and thinking about this character and, and he, his character is for the folks that haven't read the script, which is all of you listening, yeah. is based <laughs> somewhat upon a, one of my dearest friends growing up who, who passed away. Um, he passed away uh, be, really due to the side effects of his PTSD when he was deployed overseas and you know did a t couple of tours in Afghanistan and watching him kind of devolve as he came back um, really taught me a lot. You know, I feel like artists learn so much through watching pain and suffering or experiencing it themselves. And that's really what I saw and felt writing this character. So saw with my friend and then felt writing this character. And I thought back to some of those great shows that you would put on, those improv shows, where they were hilariously funny. But your character would just bleed on the stage in front of everyone, which is something mm. that you do not see very often. 
you do not see that 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 sort of uh simplicity but just like exposure the simple exposure on the stage and that's what i wanted for this character is someone who could uh speak uh who could has that comedic timing but then has that simpleness to be able to just mm, empath on on the screen um so i'm glad that you you spoke to it i'm so glad that we caught you at a moment where you're open to taking on a role like that i was worried that you might not be open to it. And so the fact that you are gratifies me to no end. And don't apologize for speaking actor speak because this topic is perfect for actors who wanting to know how to be an actor and a Christian. So why don't you take me back a little bit? We'll come back to the Socrati. Folks, if you want to pre-order, check out the link in the description. It, uh, the film, should, we're looking at production at Q1 of this upcoming year, 2024. So if you want to pre-order, check it out <laughs> in the description. <laughs> Green grab. <laughs> there you go. Um, let's come back to the Socrati later on. But tell me, what first drew you to acting, Mike? I tell you, I was um, in the Bay Area. I had moved to Oakland from Missouri. And I, I saw, I think in like the back of the, the oh, like, like the SF Weekly or something. No, it's not the newspaper. It was the fun one. You know, like all the fun stuff and that. And the back, I think it was the back page. And it had like, um, you know, San Francisco Comedy College learned to do stand up. And I was like, I've always wanted to do that. I've got a bucket list, jump out of an airplane, did it, that kind of thing. Let me try stand up. And so I started, you know, the classes and met a buddy and he's like, oh, yeah, just audition for a horror film. And I was like, dude, I want to try that acting thing. Let's try that. So I auditioned and got a role in that film. And it just continued in San Francisco area where I booked a lot. But as I say, like a lot of those things that were never made. Uh, they'll shoot the thing. There's no money for editing. You know all this stuff. So there's no money to begin with. It's like, let's just make something. And, and, and. So there's just tons of films that were never made. Um, but I liked what I was doing. And I was like, this is really fun. And then fun changed to, I, I want to try this. Like, I, and I've always loved LA. Always loved the idea before I moved here. You know, I love the, the movies. I was just talking with a friend recently, like the, so the high school lockers are outside, like all those like 80s movies. <laughs> and I was like, L.A., skateboarding, surfing, punk rock, like that's where I want to live. And then I visited a number of times when I lived in the Bay Area and went, I love the city. So that was the idea. I'm like, let me move down there. I'll I'll give my like I had a very wise girlfriend at the time. She's like, give yourself a year. Don't get right into it. Just live, live in L.A., work, make your money, live. And that's like, that's really good. I'll wait. And I think I waited like a few months and I started doing stand up, like uh, open mics. And then I was like, let me, then I started looking around for audition things. Like I wanted to wait a year, but I think I got it a little earlier. And then stand up quickly, it became as like, look, this is a whole other career. Like I just, I, you know, I, I can't give the time to this. This is not a hobby, really, you know? So I was like, let me drop that. And then continued, you know, I was, you know, having jobs and working. And then I got a, you know, agent and, went from there and I was like, all right, let's, let's try this out. Let's where with the big boys and girls now and let's see what happens. And that was, that was kind of it. Never grow like growing up. I loved movies, but I was always an animal kid loved, you know, biology, pre-veterinary, never thought I'd ever do the movie thing, never acted. And I mean, outside of what you had to in grade school, nothing, junior high, nothing, high school, nothing, college, nothing. Yeah. So, question then you, we're in San Francisco, but prior to that, you're you're a child of the Midwest, right? Mm -hmm. uh, grade school, all that grew up in Nebraska and then went to right. school in Missouri. OK, yeah. So what was the culture like or what was there any culture shock going from, you know, Midwest to California like mm -hmm. that? San Francisco. Yep. How was that? Yeah. The, the, the biggest thing, because I, I went from yeah Columbia, Missouri, Mizzou, the Tigers, and I moved to Oakland and I worked in Mill Valley, which is north of San Francisco. But that whole thing, I just the whole culture, I went, oh, because I thought I was like politically liberal, you know, as far as like, you know, Catholicism goes. It's like, look, you know, poor people, we should take care of them and all this. Like, I'm a liberal kid. And and then when I, I remember the first thing, not too far into it, when I was in the Bay Area, I went, oh, we're very liberal here, but we're not open minded. It's not an open minded like, hey. I'm liberal. You're not. Let's chat. No, like, like, like the, the, the culture climate now 
is kind of how that was even way back when, 20 some years ago. It wasn't like, let's chat. It's like, you're wrong. I hate you. Um, so that was a big culture shock. And people had difficulty with me because they're like, you're just like nice. Like, I don't be- I don't trust. It. I don't believe it. I'm like, well, it's just it's Midwest. It's, it's I'm, I'm, I'm Nebraskan, like this kind of thing. But there was a bit of a shock. But pretty much everybody, you know, the, the ones that vocalized it to me came around and we got along fine at work. And then, you know, friends and all this kind of stuff, like everybody knew who I was. Um, but yeah, a bit, a bit shocking. And I used to say, and this is crazy because it stands to this day. I used to say back then that folks around here, the Bay Area, San Francisco will march for somebody 8,000 miles away, but they won't reach their hand out to pick up their neighbor. And I just think it's still that way. It's like, you know, with the virtue signaling and whatever. So I, I noticed it hit me back then quite a bit. Yeah. So yeah, that was a, that was a culture shock. So it's been 20 years now and you say that it's still the same or have you seen any changes? Oh, no, it's even uh, I mean, it's even more that way. I mean, yeah. that was I've lived in L.A. now 18, 18 years. So when I was in Oakland six, so I first moved there. So 24 years ago, okay. first got there like in 99. And it's the same kind of thing. I mean, you know, quick, quick thing. I was up there, you know, with friends a couple years ago and friend of mine asked me you know about the political thing and i was like you really want to get into this she said yeah so i told her what i thought about things and next day she said you can't you can't stay at my house uh i don't you know i can't have somebody here that believes what you believe and i was like okay wow this was a guy this was my first friend when i moved to the bay area (laughs) what did you do what did you do after that um i was just visiting i was supposed to stay there for a few more days I think I saw somebody else on the way on the way out and went, OK, and I just drove back to L.A. <laughs> I was like, I've got no place to stay. So I'll, I'll see you later. I'm like, do you mind if I shower? She's like, that's fine. So I showered uh, and split. Like mm-hmm. I had lunch with an old roommate and her kids and went, I'm headed back to L.A. now. <laughs> At least she didn't begrudge you a shower. <laughs> I know. I know. I was like, what do I do? And, uh, you know, like, like if she says, <laughs> no, you got to get out of the house. So I'd be like, oh, that was thank Did you for that. Did you have doubts about moving to L.A. after or moving to California after that? No, that was that was a few years ago. Gosh, no, that was a few years ago. I've been in L.A. then for so many years. That was a friend of mine from the Bay Area that I went back up oh, there. Oh, I got it. I got it. I got it. Yeah. So that was that was my first that was my first friend that I met in the Bay Area. So we've been friends for 20 some years and she she got upset with my answers Oh my! Uh, yeah, so you so know, that that's how that is getting kicked out. And then there were there were two other guys that had come out. We all had dinner together at my friend's house, had pizza. Yeah. And then the next, so the next morning, my friends were like, "You got to go." And I was like, "All right." And then on the way home, I think another one of the other guys texted. I think he texted, and he he also lambasted and attacked me. He's like, "Don't you dare ever this and that." And I was like, "All right." You know, we we agree to disagree. You know, and he just kept coming at me. And then the third guy called and I was like, what? And he's like, man, what happened? And I told him and he's like, hey, we disagree on everything, but you're my brother. I love you. And I was like, thank you. Yes, we do disagree on almost everything. And we have. And you know who I am. He's like, I'd never kick you out. I'm like, that's what I'm talking about. We had 180 degree ideas on things. And he still said, I wouldn't do that. And I love you. And I was like, that's what we're talking about. We disagree and let's move on. But nowadays, so many folks just love to go. You know what? I can't. I can't have this dirt in my kingdom and they're so amazing for kicking folks right. out right. when right. just a few years ago had their belief been kicked out or whatever. So it's just, yeah. So that was the Bay area. I had yeah. first seen that then. And then, yeah. It's just kind of metastasized at this point. It sounds like, yeah. No. When I was there, so, you know, I left LA in 2021. So it's been a couple of years now. And I, you know, I originally moved there in, in 2011. So I got to see some changes over the decade. Um, yeah. For me, the most interesting uh, moment where I got to study how people felt about Christianity or felt about different values is when I was working um, at that church in Hollywood as they're, uh, you know, yeah. setting up the contracts for on location filming. In, yeah. in Hollywood. Um, it was so fascinating to see 
because you, all you do all day long is meet with different film scouts or locations for directors or producers yeah, yeah. or things like that. And you would run the whole gamut of Hollywood. So most of the producers had never even set foot in a church before. And it was interesting to see how a lot of them felt almost like they were cringing with every step. Like it was like, yeah. like th there was like some of them would like just be look really uncomfortable, physically ill almost to be inside like a church. And I'm not saying it's uh -huh diabolic at all most of the people that i met were lovely people but there's just a complete like wall when it comes to understanding what you know catholics believe christians believe what con even conservatives believe i remember talking with a young woman and i mentioned that i was pro-life and she stopped me and she said i've never met someone pro-life before <laughs> <laughs> you know you may be you you may have they just didn't say it yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's that's actually what i had how, how do you know <laughs> yeah, like that. Um, so it's 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 not it's the opposite of open minded. Yes. But at the same time, especially at the beginning of my decade there, I noticed that there was more of a live and let live. And now yeah. I, I perceived, especially with the onset of covid and I think covid really exacerbated things where it's not so much a live and let live, even if that wasn't there 100 percent before. Now it's like you're almost a disease is what I got started to get the sense. Is it that bad in your mind or, or no? Have you, have you haven't seen that? I haven't seen it that bad. Um, but I definitely know what you're talking about. Yeah. Like the COVID thing brought about a strange. Yeah. Um, distrust of neighbor and this, and that, that was the kind of thing. Like I'd never, I never in the past, I'm like, how could you turn in your neighbor? You know, when we hear these stories of, you know, these terrible yeah. regimes and whatnot. And then I'm like, you know what? Now I see how you can turn in your neighbor. Like it just, yeah. it became a badge of righteousness and self-righteousness. And again, it was this kind of weird, like, because like, like bottom line, I tell people, look, I'm a rule follower. You yeah. want me to wear a mask and putting a mask on. The second you say you don't wear a mask, the mask is off. That's yeah. all there is to it. Yeah. I don't understand a lot i have a degree in biology but apparently everyone else in the world was a phd in you know uh vaccinology because everybody then understood everything about everything and either side you're on and i was like look i don't i'm behaving myself yeah but it's going a little far and crazy and all this and it really just became this you know yeah like like if i wear a mask i am this and if i don't wear a mask i'm this and i'm gonna fight a guy at you know uh, Walmart that wants me to wear a mask and I'm going to wear a mask when I'm by myself in a car with the windows rolled up. I'm like, <laughs> okay, okay, like this, what, what, what are we doing here? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah, and then everyone's like, Oh, poor me. I can't do anything. I'm like, I had a number of times when I had friends, like they came out front, had like a little fire thing, put a little fire in the driveway, you know, had, had some sandwiches, had some drinks done and done sitting six feet away, eight feet away. You could see people. You could have like there's all this where everyone's like, oh, poor me. I'm so such and such. I'm like, no, you can go outside and be around. Yeah. You know, you just don't want to or you have the bubbles and you do your thing. And I don't it just it, it became very weird. And a lot of yeah, there was a lot of martyrs going. I haven't been outside. I don't know how to talk to people. And I'm like, all right. That's on you, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you were one of the few, Mike, that really weathered COVID nicely. Like we got out. You. Uh, a lot of our friends got out. You yeah. stayed. You stayed around. What was it about LA that made you like say, no, 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 I'm not. I'm not leaving here. I want to stay. I still love LA. I do. I do. Like you know, like I was in the Bay Area six years, and I, and I'm about year maybe four, maybe five, I started going ew. Yeah. And then LA, I'm here 18 years. I've never lived anywhere longer than this, and I'm still loving it. It's it's challenging. It's difficult. It's all, and you and I, like from day one, you know, you were like, I don't love LA. And I'm like, what? I do, you know? Um, but yeah, there's just, and what do you like about it? I'm like, I like that there's opportunity. I like that there's things. I mean, today I went to the dentist and I walked out of the dentist office. I'm like, let me go to that Italian deli across the street. Let me buy some cold cuts. And there was lines all over the place. I bought some squid ink pot. Uh, you asked me how I'm doing well. I've got my own squid ink pasta, homeboy. I bought it. <laughs> So I've got squid ink pasta. You go to and Pinocchio's? I'm just, Were you in Burbank? Did you go to no, Pinocchio's? but I love Pinocchio's. No, this was one called Mario's. I was in Glendale. 
Okay. Same kind of vibe, same kind of feel. So I go in, I'm looking around, and the next thing I know, there's just everyone's line getting their sandwiches is noon. So I had them cut the mortadella, all this, because I made my own ciabatta bread last night. I'm getting way off topic. But <laughs> all that kind of thing, you know, then like you and I, you know, you, we used to go to the brewery, the pub, as you called it. There's that. There's music. I saw, if you remember, Striper, the 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 Christian 80s metal band. Oh, yeah. Saw that with our friend Ann the other night at the Whiskey. So they're on year 40 of being a band next year. So we go to the whiskey, which is, you know, I mean, it's iconic from the doors and the maybe even the 60s. I don't know. But the doors on and it was like the 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 Mecca of like 80s hair, hair metal. So like there's that history, all this kind of stuff. Like I just love L.A. I love the fact that people are making things. People are having scripts, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so all that being said, there's also I, there's nowhere there's nowhere I want to be. I've gone a lot of places. I loved San Antonio when I went there for your wedding. And that's a cool idea. But yeah, like, I think, I think like people like you and others, like I'm kind of already done with LA. Here's a big breaking point, COVID. Let's get out. And I was like, I, yeah, I, I still like it here. Yeah. Long. Time. That's the key. What you just said right now is that there's no other Mecca. There's no other gathering, gathering place of artists no. really has the same energy. Um, and there always is one. My sense is that maybe it's time for another Mecca to, to appear. Um, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe not. Maybe I, I think that the sort of, um, the, the sort of feeling of closing off to open, like the, the, the lack of openness where it's not open-minded, what we said at the beginning, doesn't lend itself for gather a gathering place, a Mecca for artists for very long. And so my sense is perhaps Inter yeah. another one that's growing. And I don't know where, I don't know how and I don't know when, but I think that it there might be one on the way. Um, so but I think you're right. Like artists want to gather in community all the time. And that's why there's that's a huge appeal for L.A. So if a young artist wants to to, to like start off in L.A., how how do you like how do you start out? How do you survive and find work when you're just, you know, beginning should you start in Hollywood maybe, or is there another way to start out? I, t I tell you what, if I got, you know, my, my own, ex my own experience was, you know, I wasn't here. I started up uh, living in Oakland and shot the films, primarily San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, that whole thing. So I got my feet wet, beak wet, whatever feet. Yeah. Got my feet wet to a degree up there. Um, But bottom line, come out. Actually, I've even had like friends say, hey, my kid wants to act. What should they, what should they do? I'm like, anything but. <laughs> you know, you hear, you've, you've heard the people say, if you can do anything else, yeah. do that. You know, Bruce Campbell wrote, um, if Chins Could Kill, Confessions of a B-Movie Actor, the guy that did Evil Dead and all that. And he said, if you, if you want to act and you live in Minnesota, stay in Minnesota. Do community theater. Like, coming to L.A., it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nightmare. There's all this sort of you know, difficulty, you know, we're in a Herzog, the director is like, don't go to film school, take your hundred thousand dollars that it would cost or whatever and make a film. I don't know, like you guys, you writers and directors, I have no idea how you can make it here in LA and do it. Like me, I'd, I'd like, I tell people I'd much rather have my, you know, 85 no's every year. Like, no, 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 here's an audition, no failed all that then have one script and go i worked on this for years here it is and people go uh uh like i don't know i don't know how you guys do it but yeah. for me I'm like yeah just come out and i don't know there's you you hear that there's no plan b and i'm like yeah those are like the select few you hear the rest of us there's probably a lot of plan b's or plan b's that go along with plan a um what's the word parallel career Hmm. With like other careers I like. I love, I like what I do. I teach, I do these other things. It's great. Acting is great. Would it be cool if I just could make it by on acting alone? Yeah, I think so. But it's just not the way it is now. And I don't begrudge because I've had people go, I'm moving to LA and I'm never going to wait tables again. I'm like, all right, but you're going to do another job. Like it does. And then there's always a story of, well, do you know Stacy from, you know, North Carolina? She came out and got an agent. Gotcha. That happens to one person in thousands, but it doesn't mean you can't have other, you know, careers and things you like and, you know, buy squid ink pasta, uh, not bragging. I just did that. 
But, Congratulations. <laughs> that yeah. sounds delicious. It's, it's, yeah, I haven't eaten it yet, but I can't wait. Um, but yeah, that's the thing. It's like, it's just, you've got to have other stuff that you do. Like, you know, your job, you were saying to the church, like I site rep there. Mm -hmm. I love that site rep job. Get to talk to the people, do your thing. A lot of times I'm just reading, you know, while, while making sure everyone's happy teaching. I work for, you know, other folks. Like my thing I'd say, I'd say come to LA with a bunch of money, know that everything's expensive. Um, patience, 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 patience and have kind of a career idea lined up as you're doing everything else, yeah. you know? You should yeah. have kind of, kind of hooks in the, in the, in the water so that you're completely. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Well, let's, let's be practical in a different way. What about your faith? So you, you've, you gave a great example of how your values were tested by getting thrown out, physically thrown out of a friend's house. <laughs> how do you maintain those values? I think just, you know, just continuing with the faith, knowing that it's not all, you know, milk and honey all the time and there's ups and downs and um, having people of faith around friends that are that way around, you know, going to mass, all that kind of stuff, daily prayers, rosary, all this kind of stuff. You know, it's um, there's and you know this too, like there's quite there's a big old contingency of like LA Catholics, it's hard to get any group in LA together because if you haven't lived here, it's like, well, why not? And it's like, honestly, because if I were to go two miles, it's going to take 20 some minutes and travel. And it's just tough, you know, like this is only 19 miles to the West side, but like, I don't, you know, that's, that's an hour, hour and a half, two hours, depending. And we're huge where it's 20 plus miles across the city. So, like, you know, we've got nice, nice little group of folks that, you know, I definitely, you know, and I, I've like thrown parties for like, you know, Catholic folks in the industry. You know, you've been around to that one, too. Like little wine, cheese, charcuterie, whatever. You know, we had an Oscar nominated person. We've had other folks that are trying to get there. We've had showrunner um, people that have been on TV, people that have written on like it's just it's amazing. And I'm like, why don't we all hang out way more? And people are like, well. It takes a while to get to you. I've got three kids, you know, like they don't have time. Um, but yeah, that's the thing, like the just continuing, you know, with the faith. It's it's not, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I haven't had any major crosses, major troubles, yeah. you know. Well, what I'm hearing you say is a community, community is big. You, you need it's, to, it's huge. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you can't be just an island onto yourself and expect to, that's to maintain what you believe. Um, and then the second thing is routine. You know, you have your norms, your religious practices, you need to stick to them or you're going to lose them. It's kept, is that kind of what you're saying? I think so. Yeah. That's a, you, you said in four sentences, what I said in about eight minutes <laughs> and almond like, and having a sip of my berry juice. So you did, you did good. Ah, uh, thank you, sir. I appreciate yeah. it. Well, yeah. That, that kind of leads me then to the next one then. So, well, hang on. Before I move on to the next one, I, I want to push you a little bit. So you've never had um, someone like pass you over for a job. So you've been thrown out of a house before. But what about like finding work as a Christian? Is that difficult? Mm -mm. No. And I'll say this because there's as far as like jobs no i mean most a lot of what i do is commercial work so that that's not going to be much of a challenge per se and and you can there's even like you know with agencies like will you do this like will you do cigarette ads like like i've, I've felt that out in the past tobacco alcohol and like i don't smoke i used to smoke cigarettes you know that's up to you i, I would do a cigarette ad you know i thought of that booze I'm like i drink booze you know yeah i know people have problems i don't would i do you know prophylactics no but also they're not looking for me, you know, to, because it's not like, you know, they're like, hey, here's some here's some condoms. And this is the dude. And people be like, nah, I'm not going to buy that product, you know, <laughs> with that guy. They'll buy burgers from a dude like me or something They're like we're trying to look, look, look smooth and and get the ladies over here. They're not going to pick this this fella. So I don't know. Like, like I've, I've feared. I think I did one time. I, I, I don't know if I had the job or the audition or what. But there was like a GD bomb in there mm -hmm. and it didn't get to a point where I had to say anything. I think I just like slurred and went, 
you know, and like like they did that instead of like saying the GD bomb, which which I don't. I've seen people of faith do that, and it's always interesting because like you're saying it, but also like if they're a bad guy, bad guys do this. So I'm not quite sure on that, but I I've not done it, and when I did have there was it was in front of me. I, I like I slurred the word, didn't say it. And everything either went fine and we shot it or it was an audition I didn't book anyway. But no, there's really been not much. I don't know. You know, and also no one knows. No one knows me. Like I walk into a room and they're like, oh, there's that guy that's high profile yeah. for being a Catholic guy. If I was, then it might be trouble. Yeah. You know? I got you. Like, this thing goes viral and everybody's watching this podcast. They're like, oh, yeah, you know what? We don't want to hire that dude anymore. Well, so, have, have you said anything that's that inflammatory? I don't think so. No, but if somebody's like, we don't want Catholics. Ah, I see, I see, I see. That kind of thing, yeah. So I don't know. Like it's just, I, I think like I'm at either a level or a stage or whatever where that stuff just is, is can you do the work? Yeah. There you go. But it's like, do you, like, like, like the problem will be is like doing something that I find offensive. Yeah. then I'll be the one saying, I don't want to do that. And not them saying, not you. I'll be the one going, no, I'm not going to be that guy. Yes. And I don't really know at what point, because again, like I said, a lot of my stuff is commercial, which is pretty easy peasy, you know? Really what works in your favor is you have a niche and your niche is actually pretty wholesome. If you were, you know, a 20 year old blonde bombshell, um, yep. you might have a much more difficult path. Uh, for something like this, but I think you're right. Yeah, now that works, yeah. that works out nicely. Okay, well, okay. Yeah. So, two questions on on this so this this the acting side, and then let's talk about our. <laughs> go ahead. What were you saying? No, I was just going to say two questions. Yes, yeah, two. Um, so, what continues to drive you now? Like, so what changed? And a year ago, you wouldn't have taken this script. And now you are. What's what's driven you to evolve like that? I, I'll honestly say like, like a big thing with me, and I probably shouldn't tell you this, is I'm not, I've always said I'm not great at memorizing lines. But as time has gone oh, on, I've learned you've told to just that. work to be involved. Like I used to think people look at the script going, oh, I got it. And you, they do have that. Like there's the Matt Damons, you know, where the stories are like, he can look at it a couple pages and have it down. Yeah. The average bear doesn't. I just didn't know how much work it takes. And I think, honestly, a lot of it was, you know, as you mentioned earlier, Young Rock, where I was like, oh, my gosh, like this is the thing. This is what the nightmares are made of, that I'm on set and I don't know my lines. So I worked them and this and that. And I'm like, oh, it's just a lot of work. And some people, if you can look at your cards and get it, you're done. I, I, I wasn't that way. But also just the idea of telling myself consistently, oh, you're not good at memorizing lines. I'm not good at, hello, I'm not good at memorizing. And you just keep saying it. So stop saying it, put the work in. And I went, oh, this is what it's like. And also, again, Young Rock, the, the sweet thing was, I mean, they've got three cameras shooting. So if someone blows their lines, there's no scripty coming out necessarily. And no, a cut, cut. They're just like, OK, let me do it again. And you got three cameras rolling. Then they move the cameras again and three cameras. So right there, you've got six takes. Yeah. You're going to be OK. And every director we had for the show, everybody was like, you know, even at one point I went, oh, I'm sorry, it's the wrong line. They thought, and then like I heard from the other room, we just thought you were making a choice. And I was like, that's what I should have said, but I just was doing the wrong word. Sorry. And they're like, we don't, we don't, we, it's fine. So I think just the freedom to go, oh, you know what? Okay. And they were like, look, if it's a wrestling term, you got to say the right stuff. If it's a joke, you got to hit it. But outside of that, you know, so I think just doing it and being at that level of professionalism and have them, they weren't like all up tight and you have to hit everything, but I did have it down. And then, you know, they would have alts and you'd get the alts either the night before that morning. And usually they would just yell from the other room. Okay, try this one. You know, what are you talking about? Ah, what are you talking about? All right, cool. So it was, uh, it was very informal. It was the biggest, most professional thing I've ever done. And I think just like, okay, now I think I understand how much work needs to go in. And so when I got to karate, I was like, oh my gosh, this is a lot. And now it's like, okay, not on the lines, we have to worry about like the heaviness of the acting and pulling that off and, you know, getting into it and living the experience of that guy at that time. And I'm like, all right, here we go. Director believes in me. 
I'm going to be doing my best. Let's get in there and jump off this cliff together and see what we can do. Uh, you know, I like the sound of that. So before we get to that, the darkness, because I want to talk about that. Um, let's let's uh, button off where we're talking to young asp aspiring actors here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What would you give if, if there's suppose there's someone just graduated high school, just graduated college. They've done, you know, their high school or college plays and they want to pursue professionally. They want to pursue acting professionally now. Maybe they've done some casting calls in their local area, but they haven't, you know, really taken the plunge or the next step. What would you give them as advice? Um, I would say, yeah, if like, there, there are like, you know, one L.A. is the biggest market. There are other places to be if you want to do that, if that's what you want to do as a job and get paid. You know, if you're if you're on stage, then it probably is New York, maybe other places. But the big thing would be patience. And also, I've got a friend that went to Brown, you know, got a master's in art from acting at Brown mm -hmm. uh, Ivy League school. And he's out here. And I was like, you know, and he had asked something like that. And I was like, just know you're going to be in line with a lot of people. You've got your MFA from Brown. And a lot of people are going to be going, it's a good burger. <laughs> and he's like he's like i think i've and and, and i liked his answer because he was like no no i know and he was like yeah i think i'm getting there because he's coming off here and working all these things and i'm like you're going to be around other people you'll get there eventually maybe i think you know he's phenomenal um but yeah i said but at the beginning it's going to be a lot of you know just kind of like what am i doing i i went to college i did all this and i'm here with all these guys yeah for a while probably you know, and it's not ability. It's just a look, you know, that's what I've really learned, you know, is, yeah, I've got that certain look and these folks can be phenomenal actors. And, you know, we can talk about all these actors that have weird looks and all that, but maybe they've filled that, you know, filled that role. It's just, it's tough. Like hopefully there's spots and spaces for everybody enough that people can, but um, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, patience again like it just you know I, I don't know of anybody that's really come here and went oh that was easy you know I know a lot of people have tried and left they've gone to other markets they've done other things they've done better elsewhere you know you guys have one there friends moved to Oklahoma they're doing amazing stuff there uh Atlanta got friends that have moved there doing amazing stuff so yeah, I think it would be have another job that you like that pays money so you're not stressed out. Because if you go to an audition and you got to book this thing, because if I don't book this thing, I don't get the big commercial. I'm not getting my $30,000 and, and and they smell it. Yeah. But if you're like, you know what, man? And it's weird too. When you book something else, it just, it slides in. Like I had, I had booked a TV show at one time, was at a callback for an audition. They were talking to me and I was like, here's the deal. I said, they're going to cut my hair for this TV show. Yeah. You know, what TV show? And I, I was like, Southland. I love that. I'm like, I mean, me too. It's a great show. And they're like, okay. Um, all right, we'll talk to you. Then the agent's like, all right, once you cut your hair for Southland, take a picture, we'll send it to them and all that sort of thing. But it gets in their mind like, oh, this dude already booked. And you're also chill. So I think I got way off topic again. But just, yeah, have, don't be worried about the money, pay your bills. But when it gets to a point where you can't have your day job anymore because you're booking so much, good then stop your day job but until then just work 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 do your job do your thing and it's tough to find work because at least back in the day when you had to go to auditions you know not many jobs want to go that's fine you can go do four auditions today throughout the entire day it's not 15 minutes at lunchtime it's you know and if you got to drive and come back that could be two hours right there yeah. so that's the difficulty yeah, no, that's it's a juggling act. One thing, though, I, that I wanted to bring up that you said earlier that I think young actors should remember is um, how you said you you would be fine just getting a, hundreds of no's and then you get your one yes. You know, you're going to you're getting rejected, 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 and you just get it. it that's that's a skill that a lot of actors, <laughs> young actors especially, don't have. And I didn't realize this until I actually changed day jobs where I was working um, in marketing as my day job full-time. Like I, I had done a lot of film marketing living in LA, but then in 2021, when I transitioned, 
um, to, to leaving Los Angeles, I went into working marketing full time. And in other industries that are not as competitive as acting or professional sports, you know, people are not used to the level of rejection that we're used to every day as, mm -hmm. as artists. And I would be kind of shocked with my colleagues, you know, you, you still apply for stuff. Like I, I apply for awards or conferences or different types of recognition. And I would be shocked when my colleagues would get so upset if we weren't accepted. In my mind, I was like, oh my gosh, we we're accepted 75% of the time. This has never happened to me in my life before that I get accepted 75% of the time. And our colleagues would be super upset that for about the 25%. And I would be just like, wait, what? I'm used to like, you know, 0.01% success rate, if that, and that's doing great if you get it. <laughs> yeah. And, and so young artists, that's, I think, the most difficult thing to be okay with is all of that rejection. And it's an incredibly personal level of rejection where you, mm -hmm. it's like, you are just giving it everything you got. And it's, you know, it could be a very sensitive part of your soul that you're bearing at a particular moment. Maybe it's that script that you've worked on for years, or <clears throat> it's a character that you really want to get but it doesn't matter. You're still going to get rejected most of the time, no matter how much you do want that particular thing. And you, if you can weather that rejection without becoming so torn up, then you'll have, you'll be a happier person. Um, so I really liked what you said about that string of rejections and then just keep on. Yeah. That's, I remember back in the day, my agent, I don't know if it's the one I, I had an agent and they said, if you're booking, if you're booking 4%, you're doing good. I'm like, that means 96% failure rate. And you're not getting 100 auditions a year. So you're not booking four things a year. Mm -hmm. If you were, and again, there are some people that do this. Absolutely. I talked to, you know, a ton of people that do really well. Gotcha. But we're talking about the yeah. average, you know, the average person. Through if I one thing a year, that was average for me for a while. The, the young rock for me was crazy because I had never done that before. I'd booked, you know, TV show and you do one episode, you're done. Young rock. Uh, I was on four episodes. Um, Best part of the show, Mike. And I'm not just saying that. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was so fun. But yeah, but then it's funny because people are like, what's next? I'm like, I don't know. I don't do this. I do one commercial a year, maybe, you know, there. And there's been in the past where there's been nothing. You know, and that's just and then I know people that do better than me. I know people that don't do as well as me. And it's it, it is. It's just a crazy like there's one of one of these. I call them audition houses, but that's not the right word. Casting directors uh, uh, has, has a sign. It's like, you know, this uh, this audition was sent to, you know, 10,000 people. We've accepted, you know, 400. You know, whatever, 80 are going to callbacks, whatever, you know, four on a veil, one booking. And I was like, there's literally thousands of people looking at this and like, oh yeah, not thousands going in, but you know, like the casting, they say like, they're looking at computer screens, your little, you know, your little thumbnails, this, and they're, they're picking like all these people have come in. Okay. So I'm, I'm doing a commercial, you know, for the Pinedo podcast, send me your people. I'm like, yes, 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 yes. So right there, there's a whole bunch of no's already. Mm -hmm. And then the yeses have come in. So there's audition. Are you coming back for a callback? Well, maybe not. So you may audition and you're done. Then callback, you come in. Then if we like you then, then, you know, at least in the commercial word, it's a veil, short for availability, avail, you know, are you available? Uh, Non-binding verbal agreement that if book you will show up. Used to be, you know, X amount for callback. And they started calling all backs when it was like 60 or 70 for a callback, commercial primarily. Then a veil, there used to be like two or three. And then now they're doing like six people on a veil, all this stuff. And and they're not necessarily, you know, telling you, you know what, never mind. Like, so you're sitting there going, and did I get this? And the agent's like, I don't know. I'm like, can you find out? Because it's tomorrow. The worst <laughs> case scenario it was non-union, but I was it was a commercial in, and I was so excited. It was like Sweden or Switzerland. You know, it was going to pay $25,000, you know, a week in that country. And audition was like five weeks ahead of time and all this time you know wow. bingo talking to my agent and i'm like um and i'm like hey 
uh, it went up to the day before. I'm like, am I flying out of the country tomorrow? And like, let's find out. And I was like, come on. So, but yeah, most of you just go and the people go, how was the audition? I'm like, which one? Like you just, you truly just have to forget if you have more than one, there are a few that stick and you're like, oh, I really, really wanted that. And that's great. But you can't because if you're getting a 90%, 94% failure rate, you're going to be driven to the ground. And it's like someone will book good for them. There's a reason, you know, I booked a few things. Wonderful. Loved it. Great. Let's just keep going. Yeah. There's no guarantees. No one guaranteed. No guarantees saying, hey, if you come out and you're good, you're going to get it. Absolutely not. You know, there's nothing. There's no um, I'm owed this. No, you're not. You're not owed a thing, baby. You know, you come out <laughs> your best, you enjoy it. And if you don't, you know, yeah, I mean, you're working with them and for them. Like my agents are working for me, but they're also getting me the thing. But also when I get paid, they get paid. So if they're not doing anything for me, then there's nothing that can happen. So it's like we're all working together. A director wants a good thing. If he likes me, then he wants me to do my best, all that. Like, you know, it's not like I come in subservient, but also it's like, thank you so much for this opportunity. And now let me do my best that I'm here. You know, and like they say with auditions, like sometimes that's the only acting you're going to do all week. Enjoy your audition because I know people go, oh, I hate auditions. I'm like, dude, I love auditions. I go back. I watch my audition tapes. I've kept all of them on my computer. And sometimes I'm like, dude, I love that. Like, I like how that went. Didn't get it. But that was fun. I enjoyed that. That was hard for me. That was this and that, you know, and that's uh, an attitude that I have. I haven't really worked on it. It just is there. But I'm glad it is because a lot of people are talking like, oh, I hate everything. I'm like, then don't do it, baby. You don't have to do this. It ain't easy. There's no guarantees and blah, 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 blah. So, but yeah, golly, I get excited. To talk. And that's what I love, too. It's like right there, I just got wound up. I got excited. And by no means is my career just skyrocketing, you know, 51 years old, been fighting this thing for about 20 years. Get maybe one thing a year kind of thing and still. Like, that's where I get brightened up. I'm like, I love that any audition, someone's getting it. Someone's getting it. It's not a matter of, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. No, someone will. Someone's booking. Someone's got a book. I, I got to find like kind of my lane and what, what I do. And then with your script and all that, this is way out of my lane. But I'm like, okay, this is a huge challenge for me, man. This is going to be, this is exciting. So it's kind of neat. And there I'm done. Too much talking. <laughs> that was beautiful. I think I think a lot of people will find that very helpful. So thank you. So speaking about our script, when we're working on the Socrates together, um, your character is incredibly challenging. And I'll, I'll say it again, because it does have moments where you need that precision comedic timing that you have so naturally. Or maybe you spent decades honing that. I don't know. Was that a natural thing or did you did you have to work on that a lot? It's funny. I think that there's a lot of natural stuff there. Where does it come from? Like a lot of times, I think a lot of it comes from pain, mm -hmm. anxiety. I remember, and I've said this before, like I remember being in basketball and I was terrible. I didn't understand the sport, you know, and, and we had a game that weekend and I was talking to this guy who wasn't very nice. You know, I don't know, a little I was a little kid and I was like, what if the team we play is like six inches tall and we step on them and we have to pull them off of our shoe? And the guy laughed and I went, oh, <laughs> okay all right i like this because you know it's his thing and he didn't really like me and he was a better player but i was kind of funny and so that it stemmed from that and then you know teaching improv being a part of that doing the stand-up comedy but the big thing what i've really learned and then now i tell students like almost the first day is like one of the biggest things you're gonna learn from me is that it's fine to fail and i don't mind saying the word fail failing in that i tried this bit improvisationally it didn't work because you didn't understand it or i didn't do a good job or it wasn't funny it's fine like you still your family loves you wife loves you whatever like you're okay like it's fine to fail and that's the big thing i say that on my first day and i'm like i think then that just loosens you up and you're like oh failing is fine yeah. is it my favorite thing no would i prefer a 94 percent booking rate yeah but i don't have that excuse me burps so that's the thing is like it just yeah allow yourself to fail then you just have that freedom and you're like oh that didn't work but something else something else i didn't book that but something else what's next what am i doing that didn't work how about this 
Yeah. You know, and when you're improvising, you know, it's on the fly. You're doing well, it right about, now. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So really, I think that is what convinced me about, as I'm writing this character, that I wanted you to take it on. It's crazy. It's got... Uh, so the character has moments where he is... It's it's a fun character where he's cracking jokes or things like that. And I think, from what I remember, that's what you first thought about this character. Oh, he's going to have a few funny one-liners and then... Whoops. <laughs> yeah. And then you're like, nope, audience, you got something else coming. So when I saw you out there performing your improv, um, what I was struck by is that the character, it was fine to go to a dark place. Like you didn't mind, you know, talking about someone dying or something like that, you know, like, and you responded to that like a person would, you know. How did what is that like in the moment when you're speaking about something pretty dark like that on stage and you don't know where you're going? How 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 do you manage that? It's it's pretty cool because yeah you have to keep you know moving forward but also understanding that something may not be working. I, my first attempt at that is when I did stand up comedy because my mom who raised me died uh, when I was 27 and I kept trying to write jokes about my dead mother. People did not like it. You know, I was like, oh, my gosh, like I should start a greeting card line, you know, and, you know, sorry, your mom died. Have a penguin with sunglasses, you know, and no one liked that. Like it just set everybody off. And I was like, let me try. Let me try. And of course, people can. It just didn't work. So I was like, all right, you know, I, I can, you know, it's it's true. My mother had, had died. Absolutely. I'm not making fun of it. Loved her, all this kind of stuff. But and it's like, eh, it's not working. So with improv, it's like, you know, yeah, where are you? Like, how is this going to go? What do you do? There's moments of absolute, like true in the moment, humanity and, and, and beauty. And I think a lot of times people get afraid of that and want to walk away from it or or push away because, oh, it's, it's improv. It's funny. It's whatever, you know. Um, but it's like, no, there, there's a mix in there of reality. Well, how was it put? Like, like, you know, reality plus kind of funny equals improv comedy or something weird or something. So there is that mix. Um but I think, you know, if you're doing long form comedic improv, and it just turns into like a, a, a serious kind of play. Then you're like, OK, this is not what we're supposed to be doing here. This is not what we want to be doing. This is not what the audience wants. So there's got to be like like a pull out of it. But I don't know, like like it really I, I think I even like I think I was doing a scene once. I think I teared up because my partner was something and like it hit me. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And I'm like, that's amazing. Like, I teared up being empathetic. I'm a character. You're a character. And it got me. And then something else, you know, and then it was all funny and goofy. But I was like, that's pretty neat that that's thrown in there. It's not the bulk of it. There can be dramatic improvisation, but that's not what we're doing here. So how do you do that? And I think it's like a lot of good TV shows are, you know, very funny, but peppered with real reality. And don't be afraid of that. Like, if it's goofy and silly then that's your own, you're questioning yourself and it's your own, like, uh, when you're not confident, you know, just be confident, be in that. And then, yeah, I well, think that's, that's, yeah, I think that's kind of the key is that you're, you're trusting yourself and you're trusting your partner, uh, when you're out there. Yeah. And that's what we're going to be doing here with the, with these type of, <laughs> with this type of material and this type of darkness. I, I see it as conversation where you and I are, are working together through this character and through this, um, the story that he finds himself in. Like there's no, I, I almost gave away a, a spoiler right now. So I am, I've censored myself just type this a little bit. I, 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 yeah. I didn't even know we were going to bring this up. So I was like, don't say it, don't <laughs> say it, don't say it. Then you're like, Hey, here's the script. Like, okay, cool. Cause I was like, Oh my gosh. And I'd be like, just <laughs> do you know, like nothing. I was going to say Socrates. What's that? Can't say it. talk about it. So I'm glad we can. Cause I was like, just yeah. don't spill any no. beans. No, we can. We definitely can. We want, we want this process to be uh, where we're not just working together as artists and filmmakers, but we're also working with our audience through this. We're taking them on the production journey. So that's something what we're trying to do with it, with this little podcast. Okay. So we can, we can talk about, it. I don't want to give away any spoilers about it. Um, like what happens to your character or things like that, that could be 
That that those are skills. I thought there was your question. What happens to your character? I'm like, well, I answer. I'm like, oh no, I see what you're saying. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah. Yeah. But I think I think that's how we're going to to work through this is kind of trusting each other through the process. And I yeah. found early, early on in my my directing career that it's something that needs to you you can't just get the actor up to the moment where there's that great darkness you know there needs to be a you need to walk together afterwards so what i want to do here is so we're going to get to these dark moments and then you and i are going to you know continue on talking about this character so it's not just like oh we got there and now it's on to the next shot i found that actors in the past it's it's a little cruel. It's a little Machiavellian, I think. As a young director, I didn't know that an actor would respond like still be in that moment, and we have to move on to the next shoot, the next you know, the next page, whatever it is. Um, I think it's kind of a, a difficult thing when it's that we want to be that raw and that real. Um, so I think we'll just walk through together with this, and you know, your character is one of the leads, so we're able to do that. And I and then there's the 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 lead actress role that we'll be doing that together with, and that's one we haven't casted yet. Um, but we'll be working with you to to read some lines here with uh, potentials, hopefully in the next coming months. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm excited about that. Tell me one last question because I know we're running a bit over. Do you, how do you feel about movies with messages? I tell you what, man. That it's, it's such a, it's, it's a difficult thing because if you're on board with a message to a degree, yay. And if you're not, boo, <laughs> you know, you're being preached to or whatever. It's, it's interesting because, you know, being Catholic, there's a lot of, you know, films out here that aren't they're, they're they're christian but like i don't even know if i've seen any but you hear of like just the very just sugar-coated you know whatever and just say jesus in the film and people throw their money at it because it said jesus good it's a great film mm, i don't know i don't think so and then you have others that are like they just have their agenda and they're preaching and they're like okay golly just jam it down my throat but it's if, if it's in line with what you want so i don't know you know because you know it and you know like like nefarious you brought up like, I haven't seen it yet, but you just check out Rotten Tomatoes. And it's got like a 24 percent, then a 97 percent. The 24 is like, oh, we were force fed. It was a sermon. It's like, I'm sorry, we're dealing with the devil here. And <laughs> and, and I don't know. I, I haven't seen it yet, so I don't know. But it's like, well, I'm sorry. There's going to be probably some good versus evil, you know, but it's like ugh, Christian film stink. Boo. Where the vast majority of everybody else is like this was a phenomenal film. So I don't know. I think. Every almost, I mean, there's probably a message with everything you do, I would guess. But I think that's the biggie. Is like I just know that, like a Passion of the Christ, I watch every good, uh, most every Good Friday. Wow, what a movie! But then people are like, you know, what a what a dumb what a dumbbell flick. All it is is a big sermon. It's like I, it's Jesus's the like it's yeah. It's kind of a, is it a sermon? I don't know. It's doing this. What, what do you want? Some dude had some problems at one day, you know? So it's like movies with a message. Yeah. But like in reading our script, that would be the same kind of thing as like people go, boo, it's just a big sermon and you're jamming it down my throat. And it's like, I'm sorry, I had a point of view and super apologizing. It had to do with Catholicism, Christianity. Okay. Then I guess it's just this crappy movie because it has a point of view so sorry, but do whatever you want and telling me all of your stuff with your films. So it gets, it's very weird. There's and if there's a sniff of faith, anything in there, people are just like stupid. Yeah. Well, tell me, what do you think of this? Um, the line that I, and I developed this in um, conversation on this podcast, actually. So our listeners have heard it. Um, the line that I try and draw is if a, a work a piece, a production, and a painting, a song, whatever it is, a work of art has a um, message that if you were to occlude the message or take it away, then it would not stand up on its own. So, for example, the p the example we had was um, it was a song that was telling that it was like, "Oh, you dirty scabs! You broke up the union, and you you're you're never going to be around polite society ever again." It was like a country folk song about 
pro-union. You got to stay in the union no matter what. So if you were to take that message away, the song made no sense. You're singing about dirty scabs. What are you talking about? That does <laughs> I don't I don't get that. So that's an easy example. But you see that with faith based films quite a bit. If you were to take away the gospel message that they, you know, that, oh, the, the for example, I don't want to make examples because there's too many friends that we have that make faith based films. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> you that, know, Rand, his films are stinky. We love <laughs> Randy, but his films are. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, I, I, I think that um, these films serve a great purpose in that they there's a great audience for them and people want this content. But what we try to do is tell a great story that has faith elements within it. But the story exists even if you don't realize those faith elements are there and the story is enjoyable. Like, for example, yeah. we sent the script to my uh, a mentor, Father Paul Donlin, who was also a guest on the podcast. Oh. I told him that this was about um, a, kind of inspired by my kind of dread of what happened with the, the, the DC-5, where five babies were, were found, you know, aborted post-birth. And that which is illegal. And I was just, it was so dreadful to me. And that type of horror kind of sparked something, a horror type of script. And he read it and said, I don't see how this has anything to do with abortion. Um, and I was happy about that. I was great. And he actually said, I thought it had more to do with um, sex trafficking of minors, which is interesting because that's what's happening right now with The Sound of Freedom, which $40 million opening weekend, which... Oh, wow. Good. I'm okay. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that that message is getting out. Good for them. Um, and I didn't, you know, we were just following kind of the thread of the character with when I was writing your character. I wasn't thinking, oh, this is going to be about sex trafficking. I was inspired by something that happened. Inspired is the wrong word. I was horrified by something that happened uh, related to abortion. And so in my thought, this was about abortion. But it's really a fairy tale. It's just a Texas fairy tale that follows wherever we go. So do you think that that kind of, can, can we walk that line in your mind where if you kind of occlude the message, do we still have a good film? And if so, okay, we're doing something right. What do you think of that? I I, I do. I, I, I agree. And I, I truly think that there's just, again, now with, with the way society is, if they sniff anything, if you were to write anything like that, if it came out, people that are just so hip and cool would just nay nay and just push it away. And that's that without even looking at it because they can't. I, I, I do. I do think I think the average bear is not going to um, like anything that has anything to do opposed to their take. And so any kind of, you know, faith thing. But part of me is like, so be it. I mean, people don't like the way I, I live sometimes. And, you know, most of my friends, like, they, they know who I am. They know what I do. They're not coming to mass with me. They're not hanging out, but they're not opposed to it. And I've got one buddy. We'll get into a lot of discussions. He's like, I hope I don't offend you. I'm like, you, you really can't because you're just asking questions or saying things, you know. But if somebody's just like, ugh, you know, why do you always say how was your weekend and you went to mass? Why are you jamming that down my throat? Sorry, I went to mass this weekend, but that would be the review. Ugh, all Mike does is talk about weekends, got to throw mass in there, got to ram religion down my throat. And it's like, yeah, I guess I am then. I'm forcing you, you know, that. But I think that that's a very similar kind of thing is like, oh, this movie about da 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 is just jamming religion down. Blah, 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 blah. I don't know if there's a very fair because you look at all these films that have come out, except The Chosen. I think The Chosen people are kind of across the board fine with. Nice. It's good to hear. I think. I don't know, but like I've seen, like you know, now like I click on IMDb and bam, Chosen's right there. Where like, like and I just Nefaris is on my mind. One, it's a horror film and all that, but I just looked up the other day and it was that whole sort of like, ugh, this movie, ugh, what a what a you know Sunday school sermon, ugh, ugh, and then like a few you know liked it, but then the, again the numbers are thirty whatever percent and ninety seven percent or whatever. So it's like, gotcha. You put the faith in there and saying anything and people are like, oh, pu can't handle this stink ball but it's like no the, the you know you had a priest reading this and had a different take on it than you there's something in there but if it reeks I, I truly believe that people are unfair and if it reeks anything like even saying faith-based now just makes me kind of cringe it's like they're gonna hate it for no reason all it is 
without, without even saying it, you know, but, and then part of me is like, so be it. Like, you know, if you're not going to come around and watch it, then I guess. Yeah. I mean, look at, look at sound of freedom. I mean, $40 million and all those hip, cool people that you mentioned, they completely laughed it off as a QAnon conspiracy. And yet. Was it that bad? They thought at the beginning. That, that's no, it's that's what the headlines are all right now. It's like, oh, this is just a QAnon conspir- conspiracy, so pay it no heed. And how is okay? <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get frustrated, uh, with you against them, but I'm like, I don't, but but sex trafficking, like, like, how is that, uh, yeah, like, like this right wing thing, like it's happening, it's of the worst. They say there's more slave, there's more people enslaved now than ever in history, not in chains and working on the plantations like back in the day that we know of, but there's sex trafficking and things like how is that this right wing malarkey? Like, I don't know. I, I don't know. I didn't know that that was I didn't know that was. the. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Well, my point is, is that we don't need those hip, cool people, you know, to have a mm. film that is very successful. And I'm grateful for that. I think in this day and age you can go outside of the normal means of distribution and have something that's incredibly impactful and financially successful. So I think that's what we can do here. Before we sign off though, I know know that we are running way over, but I wanted to ask one last question, promise one last. Um, uh, Can you describe, this is really fun and it's fine if you don't, if you're not able to, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Describe your character to me for the audience. Oh, now I'm going to start weighing my words to not give away anything. Um, ambiguously, I'll say, is it regretful, sorrowful, damaged guy that under bad circumstances kind of did it to himself to a degree? aware of what's out there but not wanting to deal with it face to face until it until it comes to his door yeah yeah really is that enough yeah no really as someone who wants to he's running from responsibility in that way like he's almost like the the jonah and the whale sort of thing where he realized that he has that responsibility and he just couldn't handle it he has to run from it. And that's creating all of these terrible things that are happening. Um, and he just gets faced with it. He gets faced with it. So that's that that's the thing. I think I think when it comes to your door, then it's like, you know what now? Cause that that's kind of like I was even telling someone the other day. I'm like, look, like, you know, because I grew up, you know, in the 80s, Midwest, you know, we all you know, people of faith, this and that, but just don't ram, don't ram your religion down my throat. Gotcha that kind of thing. It's like, you know, I'll do my thing. But then it's like, wait, wait, wait. Now I feel like I'm getting pushed so much. It's like, you know what? Hang on. I've been told all my life, don't ram your religion down my throat. Da, 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 da. But now it's like, no, there's going to be a little pushback because everything is coming at us. So it's kind of like with him, it's like, okay, okay, okay. And then when it's at your door, you're like, you open the door and you got like the bad guy, like in the, you know, the hood mask and whatever. He's like, I'm going to rob your house. It's like, okay, what do I do now? Like it's, you know, fight or flight, defend or not or something. And that's the time that, you know, people can shine. They cannot shine. Hopefully there's more times if you don't shine. But yeah, I mean, trouble come a knocking. What are you going to do? And and I think that that's the mark of, you know, I mean, you know, we see the saints and all these people that have been through horrible, terrible things. And even people, you know, modern day that have done this and they rise above and some don't rise above. And hopefully there's redemption for the ones that don't rise above. And maybe there's redemption. We don't know. Ambiguity. Oh, there it is. <laughs> well, people, people yeah, they're able like, to like, like go online, like screenshot and then like pull a page open and read the whole script. I'm like, I don't know you could do that. That's pretty you, great technology. I didn't know that was out there. Yeah, yeah but they, Navy SEALs, they, they've read the script. <laughs> I love it. So, yeah, that, that's the thing is it'll be interesting doing like this whole damaged kind of thing. And um, yeah, what do we do? Are we, are we just continuing are we going to stay in a cesspool of failure or are we going to rise above? And we don't know. I like it. Well, let's leave people wondering, shall we? Yeah, I hope I hope I, hope I did. <laughs> <laughs> you did. You did. That was perfect. Um, how about we chat about this again in the coming months? We'll keep on updating people from the act. I loved having been able to have this kind of actor's perspective on this story because right now we're in a point where we're working on 
so much pre-production and financing and I don't get to work. I'm not working with actors right now. So would you mind coming again later on and we can talk more about this in coming months? Yeah, I don't want to do that. I'm busy. <laughs> no, I would. And I, I like it too, because again, like, again, it's not being like falsely, you know, humility false humility like i haven't been through acting class i don't know all this i haven't done meisner i don't know how to do all those things so this is very interesting and fun for me to go along with this you know because you read a you read a page and it's like you know steve said this okay what does that mean to what degree and some people go well you gotta you gotta spend 50 pages and write his backstory and know what his favorite toy was and this and other people like just say it like you would well and so it's all this like i truly don't know you know, so this is this is a learning thing for me, but it is interesting. Like, you're, you're like when I'm reading some of these things, like this feeling comes in. I'm like, oh, that means something mm-hmm. right there. That means something, you know, let's keep what talking. About that? That's good. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. So, yeah, this is that this is the work I'm doing and I'm, I'm learning as we go. I love it. OK, yeah. well, thanks for going through that with us. Um, and I look forward to- Yeah. My pleasure to have you. Thank you. Um, Thanks for the turn of the phone. Yeah, absolutely. And everyone, thank you so much for joining us here on the Pineda Brothers podcast. Please, if you are interested in this film, click that link in the description and pre-order. Every pre-order is uh, a huge shot of momentum. And so we appreciate that. And we'll keep you updated on this project. Are you are you doing Laserdisc and VHS or just beta? What do you, how are you releasing the film? Beta all beta. the way, baby. Beta all the way. Okay. <laughs> my VCR is ready to my VCR is ready to accept Socrati. <laughs> well, I think I think uh, actually it'll be a dig- it's a digital streaming that we're selling. It's a digital copy. So oh, that- we'll have to talk about that off air. I don't know what that means, but I can't wait to get <laughs> that. <laughs> okay everyone thank you so much for joining us mike thank you again and we'll thank talk to you all next time on the Pinedo brothers podcast bye-bye thank you for listening to this episode of the Pinedo brothers podcast we hope you enjoyed it and if so please consider like subscribing and commenting below that really helps this episode was edited and recorded by me jp makeup was done by no one if you couldn't tell The Pinedo Brothers are Catholic filmmaking brothers working to revitalize the world of Catholic art through film. For more information on us, check us out at PinedoBrothers.com. Thanks again.